Well, good evening, everyone. We're glad that you're here, and we're going to uh, teach on the subject tonight of uh, Kingdom of Priests. And so, uh, to begin this teaching, if you'd like to, turn to the book of Exodus and chapter number 19. And I'm going to read a few verses from Exodus 19, beginning with verse 1. And it says, In the third month, after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And there Israel camped in front of the mountain. This is interesting because it says uh, in the third month, so less than 90 days, less than 90 days, uh, being free from Egypt within that time frame, now they've come to a place where after coming out of bondage and less than 90 days later, they come to a location and it's called Sinai. And there are three peaks of the mountain range of Sinai. The highest one is Hermon. And so here they camped at uh, Sinai. Now it's interesting also, I might just interject this, that Mount Sinai was uh, a place where the children of Israel had both high points and low points. Uh, the same location, but uh, at Sinai they uh, received and they ratified the Ten Commandments and uh, the majority of the history of Moses. But also at Mount Sinai they rebelled against God and they made a idol out of gold. And so they had ups and downs in this location, kind of like our life. Same location, ups and downs. But the point of all that, you need to continue listening to what God is saying to avoid the downs and have more ups, I guess is one way to put it. But they came to this location and says that they camped in the wilderness. And, and so the word wilderness in Hebrew is midbar, M-I-D-M-A-R, midbar. And it means uh, several things. It means uh, isolation, and it also means communication. So here they came to a, a location, if you will, for preparation of what they were to involve themselves in next. And in this place, in the wilderness, they began a period of time of isolation and communication, where the only voice they were really hearing was the voice of God. They were isolated from all the sounds of uh, the cities and the other people. And so here they are in a place, and I would also refer to this as a proving ground, preparing for something uh, larger than you've ever experienced before. And so they begin to wait for instructions from the Most High God. And in verse number 3 it says, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord God called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel. So here Moses is having an, an encounter with God personally, uh, basically face to face. And God is beginning to say words to him that he is to convey to the children of Israel. Words of import. Very important words because this was what their future was going to be based on. So God said to him, say these words to the children of Israel. He said, first of all, say to them, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. And how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. That, in my estimation, is a representation of redemption and reunion. God redeemed them, and now they're reunited in the presence of God. And so he says, you, you know yourself, you've seen with your own eyes how I brought about something that you thought might never happen. But I brought about this uh, reunion and this redemption, and I brought you to myself. So they'd experienced supernatural intervention to bring them back to a place of being reunited with their, with their God, basically. And then in verse number 5, it says, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. So God is saying, not only is there going to be uh, redemption and reunion, but there's going to be this relationship. Relationship with me. You've been redeemed, you're reunited, and now we're back into relationship. And then in verse number 6 it says, And, in addition to these other things, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. 
a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So this whole sequence here, I see redemption, reunion, relationship, and rulership. And this is the process of moving into the sovereignty over your territory that God wants you to experience as a member of his kingdom and a priest in the earth unto him. So let me just briefly give you kind of a broad stroke definition of the word kingdom. Kingdom it has both abstract and concrete meanings. The abstract is uh, kingdom is an estate or a status or a position. The ruler, the kingdom, he is the kingdom. She is the ruler over this territory. And that's the other word, which is concrete. Kingdom means an area or a territory or a space, a population, if you will. And so when we talk about kingdom, there are these two realities, abstract and concrete. It's a position and it's territorial. And we need to understand that as we go into this teaching tonight because I'm teaching about God's kingdom. So therefore we understand the abstract of God's kingdom is you have a status, you have a position in His kingdom. And also you are being given designated territory, a dominion if you will, to rule over. And that's another definition. When it comes to God's kingdom, we're talking about a realm of governmental authority over which God's sovereignty extends. It's a realm of governmental authority over which God's sovereignty extends. In other words, it's a dispensation of the heavenly empire. Uh, satellite kingdoms in the natural realm. Heavenly empire. So that covers being a kingdom. Uh, but God says, I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests. And so the word priest in uh, Hebrew is kohen. And uh, a priest is a, uh, a channel of heaven and earth communication, a connection. A priest also is in a position of high-level direct access to deity. A priest has high-level access to deity. Priests have this active function as a mediator between God and God's people. You are the priest of your own household, your own self. So you have this high level of direct access to deity. And you have an active function to be a mediator for yourself and your family or whomever between God and God's people. So when God made that statement, shortly after the people coming out of a long period of bondage, it's interesting that the first thing he would underline was, I'm going to bring you into a place of royalty and rulership. They didn't even know what that meant. They'd been in bondage for, for hundreds of years. Now they're about to go into a dynamic that they had never experienced before. And God drops his bombshell on them. If you obey me, you're going to be a kingdom of priests. And they were, wow, what does that mean? And we need to know what that means. And so he gave them this word. And so I want to talk about priesthood tonight. Basically, we are a kingdom of priests. And the Bible recognizes three priesthoods. The first priesthood that the Bible recognizes is the order of Melchizedek. And in Genesis chapter 14, it mentions that in Genesis chapter 14 and verse number 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Sounds like communion service to me. Brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God. Most high. So he was a priest of God most high. That's the first priesthood recognized legitimately in the word of God. And that is the priesthood of Melchizedek. The second one is the Levitical priesthood. And you can find that mentioned uh, initially in uh, Exodus chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40. And when you look at this, you'll realize that God was uh, uh, establishing an institution, a priesthood institution in the earth realm. And so in Exodus 
chapter 40. If I can find it in my Bible, it was there this afternoon, I saw it. And when you look at these scriptures in verse number 12 of Exodus chapter 40, there's this instruction. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Verse 13 says, And you shall put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him that he may be a minister as a priest to me. So God is initiating the institution of priesthood. It's interesting also to know that the first high priest of Israel was a Levite named Aaron who happened to also be uh, Moses' older brother. And so he uh, had been in bondage all of this time. Even when Moses committed murder and left Egypt, Aaron remained behind and was there until finally they came out of Egypt. And so he was really moving into a new dynamic. And so God says, I'm going to make you a minister as a priest to me. Verse 14, and you shall bring his sons and put tunics on them, and you shall anoint them, even as you have anointed their father, that they may minister as priests to me. And their anointing shall qualify them for a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. So God established the Levitical priesthood beginning with Aaron and his sons. The other priesthood recognized in the Word of God is the new creation nation of kings and priests. The new creation nation of kings and priests. You can read about that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Again, we're seeing rulership and relationship intermingled here. And this reunion of God's people, He chose them, He chose us as new creation beings to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And He goes on to say, here's why, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. There is a comprehensive representation of what it is that we're to be about. Kings and priests in the earth realm are to be uh, speaking the excellencies of Him who brought us out of darkness into the light, into the brilliant light of God Himself. This is our assignment, not only to bring kingdom reality into manifest form, but to speak of the excellencies of the One who brought us out of the obfuscation of the enemy so we might see the truth and begin to walk in the truth under the glory of God and not be in the bondage to sin that we were before under the glory of God. So these are very important phrases here that I'm teaching you tonight. So this is the third recognized priesthood recognized as legitimate in the Bible, new creation nation of kings and priests. Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. And Jesus Christ is the eternal high priest. He's a king and he's a priest, the ultimate thereof. And I want you, if you will, would like to, to turn to Psalm 110, and we'll see this narrative here that lays out that very expressly in Psalm 110, and we see in verse number 1, the Lord says to my Lord, so Yahweh is speaking to Messiah Adonai, and we are privy to that conversation because of inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We know what the conversation was. Holy Spirit has had this recorded for our benefit. So Yahweh is speaking to Mashiach Adonai. And he said to him, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter. That's a rulership emblem. The scepter of authority. That authority over demonic forces. That's what that represents. So here he's referring to Christ as a king. The strong scepter from Zion, from the people of God. Your scepter will be stretched forth. And then he says, and rule. You're a king, then you will rule. 
through this scepter of authority in Zion, you will rule in the midst of your enemies. We have a major role to play in the success of King Jesus making his enemies his footstool. And it says that right here, basically. He said, then your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. Or they will submit themselves as a free will offering to be involved in the power of God. Or you make this transition into rulership. And then in verse number four, it says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind that you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so we see here, the Bible is laying this out for us very, very clearly. And so I want to interject this. Melchizedek was a placeholder until the Christ came. He held the position of priest, holding that place for the great high priest when Jesus Christ came under the glory of God. And so let's talk a little bit about Melchizedek as the placeholder in Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 3. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 4. And no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself, so as to become a high priest. But he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now I want to underline that because even in the case of Jesus Christ, the great high priest, he had to be appointed a priest. He didn't volunteer to just positionally become that. That's, the, the, that's how it is. That's the order. That's the proper protocol of becoming a priest. And so this happened and he was going to be a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he abides a priest perpetually. Close attention to that scripture lets you know that Melchizedek was a created celestial being. He was not a human being. He was a created celestial being. God made him like the Son of God. No beginning, no end, no genealogy, no mother, no father. And he created by, was created by God to be, to be the eternal creation priest king. To have the priesthood over creation itself. In fact, if you read the scripture closely, the inference is very clear. That in Eden, Melchizedek officiated at the only creator altar on the planet. When Adam and Eve fell, a sacrifice was necessary. The, the priest of creation was there, and Melchizedek officiated over that ceremony of the sacrifice of blood when God covered Adam and Eve with the skins of animals. He was there in that garden to, for that very purpose. Being over creation itself, he was there to oversee the fact that creation had been intruded upon by the enemy. And now something needed to change, and so that sacrifice was made. So speaking of kingdom of priests as we are tonight, Melchizedek, by the way, he lives today. He lives today under the high priestly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has now taken his position that was held by Melchizedek until his arrival, and Melchizedek lives today under the high priestly ministry 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. What In what capacity? As the active priest of the New Testament tithes and offerings presented to Creator God. He received tithes from Abraham. He receives tithes now that are offered unto God in the realm of the Spirit. He is the overseer, the priest over the tithe and the offerings that are presented to Creator God right now. So maybe that will bring us to a point of pause and realize when we bring our tithe and our offering willingly and cheerfully, we're interjecting ourselves into a supernatural event where there's an overseership of a priest watching our giving to God and taking that from us and giving it into the coffers of the heavenly realm under the glory of God. These are important things that we need to understand. We're not just going through patterns and rote, but rather everything we do as believers has a spiritual, eternal connotation. And so here Melchizedek is still performing that particular part of the priesthood. Jesus Christ is the perfect high priest. He is the perfect high priest. Hebrews chapter 2. And in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 16. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. We're speaking of Christ Jesus, and we're going to get to the high priest part of this in a moment. But what that is saying is God is not obligated to take hold of angels. But God has obligated himself to take hold of the seed of Abraham. This is a powerful phraseology. God has volunteered to take you, take hold of you, and usher you through the success of your destiny. He's not obligated to do that for angels. The next verse says, verse 17, Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren. In all things that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. In things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So he now is our great high priest. And God takes hold of us voluntarily. And causes us to stay directionally, navigationally correct. That we go forward in our destiny according to his will and his purpose. So that having been said, that God has obligated himself to help us. Verse number 1 of chapter 3 in Hebrews, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. So while he assists us, we confess the reality of the situations, the reality of the destiny components that he's revealing to us. So here, Jesus is being shown as the perfect high priest. And uh, what I'd like to speak about next is, the next category of this teaching, we are part of the new creation nation of kings and priests. We are. And we have been legally appointed, legally appointed as kings and priests in the earth realm. So we are legitimate. We're recognized by God legitimately. That we are authenticated kings and priests. Because he has appointed us that and called us that under the glory of God. So legitimate priests indeed. In Hebrews chapter 5 again. Hebrews chapter 5. And we look at verse number 1. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God. So as we are appointed as human beings, we're receiving that appointment from God, pertaining to things of God. And then in verse number four, as I read to you earlier, and no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. You have been called by God to be a priest unto him. You're, you're legitimized by God. You're authenticated. And as you've even been codified in the heavenlies. You're written down as that. A son of God, a child of God, a king and a priest in the earth. All of these things are legally documented in the heavenly realm. 
And so with that kind of a status and that kind of a positional reality, we must begin to uh, pursue the fullness of what that uh, 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 allows us to uh, experience in the earth realm. Uh, my word would be, we're living below our potential. So this tells me, though, that the potential is still available, and I'm still legally, in the eyes of God, a king and a priest, even if I have not fully fulfilled my duties the way God knows that I can. I love God. Thank you for that, Lord, for doing that. So now, in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says in verse number 4, and coming to him, that's Jesus Christ, and coming to him as to a uh, living stone, rejected by men, but chosen and precious in the sight of God. Verse 5, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So you're being uh, matured, you're being built up. To fill the capacity of priesthood like a living stone, solid, a chip off the old block, if you will, ready to become the fullness of what God designated for you to be. Then again in verse number 9 of First Peter 2, but you are a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a people for God's own possession. That really categorizes you as a unique individual among the commonality of humanity. You stand out in the eyes of God. You have spiritual status and gravitas. You have influence in the realm of the spirit. And God has designated you for that capacity. He knows full well you can do it. He would not have selected you if he thought you could not do what he's assigned for you to do. So thank you, Lord, that we are assigned by you to be kings and priests in the earth realm and help us to understand the fullness of the scope of that that we might fulfill your purpose and become a delight to you in your kingdom revelation chapter 1 revelation 1 Verse number 5, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, prototokos, ekton, nekron, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 5, verse number 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and did purchase for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth this is very explicit you can't miss this God has become the cause of the effect in my life that I'm a king and that I'm a priest he caused what I am <laughs> he made me to be a kingdom priest. Hallelujah. Therefore, because of that, I relish in the fact that the full scope of this is yet to be seen. The glory of God is about to be elaborated upon. God is about to become very, very militant in His praise, in His glory, in His power, through kings in the earth unto God. Amen. So here we see that we are legally appointed by God as kings and priests. Now, legitimate, true priests, they know how to effect the proper utilization 
of the sacred blood of the Lamb. If you're a true priest, you know what to do with the blood. We're all probably raised, if we're raised in church, our mothers would plead the blood of Jesus over us as we went out the door each morning, and we've done likewise. Well, there's more to it than just that. That's a good thing to do. But we, as legitimate true priests, we need to know how to effect or cause the proper utilization of the sacred blood of the Lamb. Let's begin in Romans 3.23. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 24 says, Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, very important verse, Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness because in the forbearance of God He passed over the sins previously committed. This is important stuff. That word says that because of Jesus Christ, we've moved from simply passing over sins, Old Covenant, to the point where He has now become the propitiation or the appeasement that was sufficient to allow God to make concessions through grace and grant us forgiveness of sins, and the sins are forgiven forevermore. It's not an annual temporal thing. It's an eternal thing in perpetuity from now on because of the blood of Jesus Christ through faith. So I see that this is an important word. Old covenant was just passing over. Old covenant was just from year to year. Old covenant was temporal, but now we see that propitiation has made it perpetual and has made it eternal. And it continues likewise throughout eternity into ages to come. In 1 Peter chapter 1, it says in verse number 18, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things, like silver or gold, from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless. Ah, the, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. The eternal Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world, and now he's come to reveal himself to you that the effectiveness of his blood is still in effect under the glory of God. And because of that, through faith, you're saved in Jesus' name. Ephesians 2.13 adds to this narrative tonight that I'm teaching you in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That sounds like Exodus 19, where he says, you've seen how I've brought you to myself. You've seen where now you're in a position of relationship to step into rulership. Sounds just like that narrative from the Old Covenant, except now it is a better narrative because it is a better covenant. We've gone from separation to inclusion. From isolation to community. God wants you to get this tonight. You are unequivocally a member of the family of God. That God loves with all of his heart. Amen. The last portion of this teaching tonight will be on the kingdom of priests. New creation priests are aware of and fully respect the enormous value of the body and the blood of the Lamb of God. We are aware of it and we give full respect to the value of the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. For example, we as priests in a corporate setting, 
pastors, ministers, teachers, individuals. We can be a priest in that setting or in intimate family gatherings or just individually where it's just you by yourself. But as a priest, you can reverently conduct Holy Eucharist, Holy Communion, knowing full well what you're doing because that is a central act of Christian worship. And as a priest, you're conducting that, even if you're conducting it while you're using sourdough bread and orange juice. It's still Holy Eucharist. Shumahadah. Mm. So we see then, we have this authority to uh, see transcendent uh, value systems uh, interact with our natural uh, level of constriction and begin to move into the fullness of what communion or Holy Eucharist is. The Catholic Church has taken this to the extreme to the point where even now the individual who thinks he's the president of this country is being threatened by bishops that they just might take away his partaking in the Holy Eucharist because he's for abortion of babies. They take it seriously. And it's only a religious thing with them. But we are spiritual kings and priests. And when we use that context, even when we participate in Holy Eucharist or Holy Communion, it's a form of worship. It's a form of clarity of what Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords did for us taken very seriously under the glory of God. So let's see some of that tonight as I draw towards the end of this teaching in Matthew chapter 26. Jesus said in verse 26, And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Matthew 26, verse 26. Verse 27, And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. And so when Jesus said these words, I want us to really try to understand this tonight, uh, because uh, there's something that we need to uh, take into consideration how supernatural those statements are and how the supernatural experience of that is not just aspirational, it's achievable. You can experience this. And so let's continue in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 16, is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? That word sharing is Greek for koinonia, which means literally participating in the reality of what it is. When we receive communion, we're literally sharing or participating in the reality of the body and the blood of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, and Paul is writing this, and he says in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for, your, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25, In the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So God wants us to understand tonight that there is a supernatural event, and I believe this with all of my heart. When we partake of Holy Eucharist, Holy Communion, in the right attitude of worship, 
there is what I refer to as transmutation that takes place. That liquid and that substance of bread becomes the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. If this were not so, Jesus would not have seen a number of his followers leave him on one occasion when he said to them something that was very hard for them to accept. He said, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you are not one of mine. And masses of people left his ministry saying, this guy has got a screw loose. And that's when Jesus said to his disciples, will you leave also? And they said, where would we go? You have the word of life. So he expects us to realize when we're in the uh, kingdom of God, we are eligible for supernatural events and experiences, including Holy Eucharist. Leviticus chapter 17. Verse number 11. A brief comment about this. Leviticus 17, 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Again, there's that melding of priesthood, the, the altar, atonement, the blood, priesthood. And he said, life is in the blood. Uh, the blood is the only uh, moving organ of our body. Our, uh, the blood system, it, it is a moving organ that's mobile and transports life throughout the body. Everywhere the blood goes, life goes. That's just like Jesus Christ, the life blood of the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. And the blood of Jesus is the life blood of we, the body of Christ. We're alive and living supernaturally as kings in the earth because of the life blood of Jesus Christ. We need to understand this. The, the, the life is in the blood. The covenant is alive because of the blood. The, the covenant of God is a living document because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, in the realm of the Spirit, blood has intelligence and a voice. Hebrews 11.4 By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. He offered a blood sacrifice through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. The blood of Abel still speaks. Transcendent voice of the blood. It's a sound, I tell you. I once heard in our Kansas City, Kansas, the blood of abused children crying out from the soil. As I was standing with a group of people, I heard the voice of the blood of these innocent ones that had been slain in an orphanage, and they were crying out, Will someone finally hear us? Will someone finally redeem us? I know that the blood has intelligence and a voice in the realm of the Spirit. Beyond the natural boundaries, it is absolutely transcendent, a sound of the blood. In Hebrews 12 and verse number 24, And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So the blood of Jesus Christ is a transcendent blood that speaks even better than the blood of Abel. It is a transcendent sound. It has a transcendent efficacy. The blood of Jesus Christ speaks of the new covenant. The blood of Jesus Christ speaks the articles of the new covenant above and beyond the boundaries of time and space. From ancient Eden into ages to come, the blood of the Lamb is eternally effective. Ha! Ancient antiquity into the future. The blood of the Lamb speaks volumes of the new covenant. 
We are kings and priests because of the new covenanted blood. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. And so I bring this down to the final two verses, uh, portions in Hebrews 9, bringing it back full circle to that we are a kingdom of priests. So in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered through into the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Again, his blood speaks eternally. Now, if you turn the page, if you need to, to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19, it says this, speaking now to us, Jesus is our example. Hebrews 10, 19, Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Now, this is an extrapolation. We get to go into the holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And then let's have the retention of the comprehension by articulation because it says next, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. God bless you tonight in the name of the Lord. I hope you receive something from this teaching. Are there any questions? Good, because I have no answers. Thank you very much for the opportunity.